from around the globe. It's the Cube with digital coverage of AWS Public Sector Online. Brought to you by Amazon Web Services. Hi, and welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of AWS Summit Online. I'm Stu Miniman, your host for this segment. Always love when we get to talk to the, the practitioners in this space, and of course, at AWS Public Sector, you know, broad diversity uh, of backgrounds and areas, uh, everything from uh, government to education and the like. Uh, so really happy they were able to bring us. Uh, Joshua Spence, he is the Chief Technology Officer uh, from West Virginia in the Office of Technology. Josh, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate the invitation to be here. All right, so, you know, technology for an entire state, uh, quite a broad, uh, you know, mandate when you talk about that. Maybe give our audience a little bit of your background and, uh, you know, the role of your organization uh, for, for West Virginia. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in the public sector space, especially at state government, uh, we're involved in, uh, a myriad of services of for government um, to the citizens and from a central IT perspective we're seeking to provide those enterprise services and support structures to keep those costs uh, controlled and efficient and be able to enable uh, these agencies to service the citizens of the state excellent maybe just you know talk about uh, you know the, the role of the state versus uh, you know more local uh, you know from a technology standpoint, you know, how many applications do you manage? How many people do you have? Um, is everything that you do in the cloud or do you also have some data centers? Just gives a little thumbnail sketch, if you would, of what, what's, what's under that umbrella. Sure, absolutely. I think uh, you, you'll see at the state level, we have, uh, we typically administer a lot of the federal programs that uh, come down through funding, um, ranging from health and human resources to environmental protection to public safety. Um, you've got uh, uh, just a, a broad spectrum of uh, services that are being provided at the state level. And so the central office, the Office of Technology Services is approximately 22,000 state employees and their ability to carry out those uh, services to the citizens. And then of course, you have like uh, local government, like in the state of West Virginia, with 55 counties, and then you're following municipalities. Uh, the interesting thing, though, in public sector is, uh, from the citizens' perspective, uh, government is government, whether it's local, state, or federal. Yeah, that's such such a good point. And you know, right now, of course. Uh, there's a strain on everything. With the global pandemic, uh, you know, services from the public sector are needed more than ever. Uh, maybe help us understand a little bit, you know, things like you know, work from home uh, and uh, uh, unemployment, I expect, uh, you know, may, may required a shift um, and some reaction uh, for, from your office. So tell us uh, what, what's been happening in, in your space the, the last few months. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, well, the first part, yeah, you get the work from home piece, right? Uh, West Virginia, although the last state to have a confirmed uh, test positive of, of COVID-19, uh, we were in a little bit of a, a position of advantage as we were watching what was happening across the world, across the country. And so we didn't hesitate to react in West Virginia. And uh, through great leadership here, uh, we shut down the state quickly. Uh, we put uh, protections in place to help uh, shore up and prevent the spread of COVID. And to do that though, with the government uh, facilities, government services, we had to be able to enable a remote workforce and do so very quickly um, at a scale that no one ever anticipated having to do, right? Coop plans, for the most part, projected just picking up from the location you're working at to go work at another centralized location. Uh, no one really ever thought, well, we wouldn't be able to all congregate to work. So that created uh, our first challenge that we had to respond to. Uh, the second challenge was then how do we adjust government services to interface with citizens from a remote perspective? And in addition to that, a surge of uh, need. And uh, when you look at unemployment uh, all across the country, the demand became uh, exponentially larger than what was ever experienced. The systems were not equipped to take on that type of load. And we had to leverage technology to very quickly adapt to the situation. Yeah, I, I, I'd love you to drill in a little bit on that technology piece. Obviously, you know, you think about certain services, if I had them, uh, you know, just in a, a data center and I needed to all of a sudden ramp up, do I run into capacity issues? You know, can I actually get to that environment? How do I scale that up fast? Uh, the promise of cloud always has been, well, I, I should be able to re react immediately. I have, 
you know, in theory, infinite scale. So what has been your experience? Uh, you know, are, are there certain services that you say, oh boy, I'm, I'm so glad I have them in the cloud? Uh, and have there been any struggles uh, with uh, being able to uh, react to, to what you're de dealing with? Well, yeah, the, the struggles have absolutely been there, and it's been a combination of not just on-premise infrastructure, but then legacy infrastructure. Um, and that's what we saw when we were dealing with the unemployment uh, surge here in West Virginia. Uh, just from a citizen contact perspective, being able to answer the phone calls that were coming in, it was overwhelming. And what we found is we unfortunately had a number of phone systems all supporting, whether it's the central office or the regional office, they were all disparate, uh, some of which were legacy. We therefore had no visibility on the metrics. We didn't even know how many calls were actually coming in a day. Uh, when you compound that, the citizens just trying to find answers, well, they're not going to just call the numbers you provide. They're going to call any number. So then they're now also calling other agencies seeking assistance uh, just because they're wanting help. And that's understandable. So we needed to make a change. We need to make change very quickly. And that's when we look to see if a solution in the cloud might be a better option. Um, and, and would it enable us to not only correct the situation, get visibility and scale, but could we do so extremely quick because the time to value was what was real important. Excellent. So, uh, my understanding that you were not using any cloud-based contact center uh, before this hit. Uh, we were, and only uh, there were some other agencies that had some uh, hosted uh, contact center capabilities, but on a small scale, uh, this was the first large and um, uh, project around a cloud contact center, um, and to, to run the project from go live uh, or decision to go forward uh, on a Friday at one o'clock and to roll over the first call, um, call center on the following Monday at 6 p.m. was a speed that we had never seen before. Oh boy, yeah, I mean, you, I, I think back, you know, I, I worked in telecom back in the 90s and you know, you talk about, you know, a typical deployment, you used to, you know, measure months um, and, and you're talking more like hours uh, for getting something up and running. And there's not only the technology, there's, you know, the people, the training, all these sorts of things there. So. Yeah, tell, tell us, how did you come to uh, such a fast decision and deployment? So you walk us through a little bit of that. Sure, so we, we went out to the, to the market and asked several providers to give us their solution proposals um, and to do so very quickly because we knew we had to move quickly. And then when, upon evaluation of the options before us, we made our selection and indicated that selection and started working with uh, both the cloud provider and the integrator uh, to build out a phased approach deployment of the technology. Phase one was, hey, let's get everybody calling the same 800 number as best as we can. Um, and then where we can't get the 800 number be the focal point, let's forward all other phone numbers to the same call center. Um, because uh, before we were able to bring the technology in, our only solution was to put more people uh, on the phones. And we had physical limitations there. Uh, so. We went after uh, the Amazon Contact Center or the, our integrator uh, Smartronics and we were able to do so very quickly and get that phase one change in place, which then allowed us to decide what was phase two and what was going to be phase three. Yeah, uh, you know, Josh, you, you've got some background in cybersecurity. Uh, I, I guess in general, there's been a, a raised uh, uh, awareness and need for security uh, with the pandemic going going on. Uh, you know, bad actors are still going in there. Uh, I, I've talked to some when they're rolling out their call centers. You know, they need to worry about. Uh, you know, so it sounds like you've got everything in your municipality, uh, so might not need to worry about you know governance per se, but. Um, I, I guess if you could touch on security right now for, for uh, what's happening in general and anything specific about the contact center that you need to make sure that, you know, people working from home were following, you know, policy procedure, you know, not breaking any, you know, regulation and guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. I think the most important piece of the puzzle when you're looking at security is understanding it's always a question of risk, right? If you're if you're seeking first and foremost uh, to put in security with the understanding that now, hey, we've we've put it in, we don't have to think about it anymore. That's not the answer because uh, you're not going to stop all risk, right? You have to weigh it and understand which risks you need to address. So that's a really important piece. The second part that we've looked at in, when uh, in, in the current situation with the response to COVID is not only do we see threat actors trying to take advantage of the circumstances, right? Because more people are working from home, there are less computers on, this, on the hardened network, right? They're 
now either VPN in or they are just simply outside the network and there may be limited visibility that the central agency or the central entity has on those devices. So what do you do? Well, you got to extend that uh, protection out to the account and to the devices itself and not worry so much about the boundary, right? Because the boundary now is, is a lot in a lot of sense and purposes of the account. But then I think an additional piece of the puzzle right now is to look at how important technology is uh, to your organization. Look at the role it's performing in enabling your ability to continue to function remotely. That increased the risk um, associated with those devices becoming compromised or unavailable. So uh, we see we see that the most important aspects of our security changes were uh, to, to extend that protection as best we could to push out education to the users on the changing um, threats that might be coming their way. Yeah, it, it, it's fascinating to think if, if this pandemic had hit 10 years ago, you wouldn't have the, the capability of this. I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking back to like, well, you know, we could forward, uh, you know, numbers to uh, a, a certain place and do some cascading. But, you know, the, the cloud contact center, uh, you know, absolutely wasn't available. Have you had a chance to, to think about, you know, now that you have this capability, what this means? Uh, you know, a, a, as we progress down the road, you know, will, uh, do you think you'll be keeping, you know, a hybrid model or stay, you know, f f fully cloud, uh, you know, w once people are, uh, you know, moving back to uh, the offices more? Well, I definitely think that the near future is a hybrid model and we'll see where it goes from there. There's workloads without a doubt that are better served putting them in the cloud, um, giving you that uh, on-demand scalability. Uh, I mean, if we look at what uh, a project like this would have required had we had to, to you know, uh, procure equipment, install equipment, you know, there was just no time to do that. So having the services, the capability, whether it's microservices or VMs or whatever, all available just to need to be uh, turned on and configured to be used, uh, it's just a, there's a lot of power there. And uh, as government seeks to develop digital government, right, how do we transition from providing services where citizens stand in line to doing it online? I think cloud's going to continue to play a key piece in that. Yeah, I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to the financial impact of, of this. So, you know, typically you think about, you know, I, I roll out a project, it's budgeted, uh, you know, we, we write it off over, you know, a certain number of years. Uh, you know, cloud, of course, by its nature is that there's flexibility um, and, you know, I'm paying for what I'm using, but this was something that was unexpected. So how, how are you, do you have oversight on this? Was there, you know, additional funding put out? How, how is that financial discussion uh, happening? Yeah, so that's a big piece of the puzzle. And when it's when a government entity like state is under a state of emergency, the good thing is there's um, processes and procedures that we we leverage regularly to understand how we're going to fund uh, those uh, those response activities. And then the federal government plays a role also in responding to states of emergency that that enable uh, the the state and local government to have additional funding to cover uh, during the state of emergency. Uh, so that's that makes things a little easier to start in the sense. I think the bigger challenge is going to be what comes from the, the following years after COVID, uh, because obviously. Obviously, tax revenues are going to take a hit across the board. And what does that mean to government uh, budgets that then in turn are going to have to be adjusted? Um, so the advantage of, of uh, cloud services and other type technology services where they're sold under that OPEX model do give uh, states flexibility in, in ways to uh, scale services scale um, solutions as needed um, and give us a little bit more flexibility um, in adjusting for budget uh, challenges. Yeah, it, it's it's been fascinating to watch. Uh, you know, we, we know how the the, the speed of adoption uh, in technology, you know, tends to run at a certain pace. Uh, the last three months, uh, there there are definitely certain technologies that there's been massive acceleration, like you've discussed. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering that you've had, you know, the modernization. Uh, things like the uh, uh, the unemployment claims uh, was the immediate uh, requirement that you needed, but have there been other uh, pieces, uh, you know, other use cases and applications uh, that this, you know, modernization uh, leverage of cloud technologies uh, is impacting you today, or other things uh, that that you see a little bit down the down the path? Yeah, I think it's uh, we're going to see a, a, a modernization of. Um, 
government applications designed to interface directly with the citizen, right? So we're going to want to be able to uh, give the citizen an opportunity, whether it's on a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer, uh, to uh, interface with government, whether it's a communications to inquire about a service or to get support around a service or to file um paperwork around a service, we want to, we want to enable that digital interface. And so that's going to be a big push and, and it's going to um, be amplified. There was already, already a, a, a look toward that, right, with the smart cities and smart states and, and some of the uh, initiatives there. But uh, what, what's happened with COVID is basically it's forced the issue of, uh, of not being able to be physically together. Well, how do you do it using technology? So if there was a silver lining in, 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 in a, an awful situation that we have with, with COVID, uh, one might be that you know, we've been able to stretch our use of technology to better serve the citizen. Well, well, great. Uh, really, really impressive story. Uh, Josh, I want to give you uh, the, the final word. Uh, just uh, what advice would you give your peers kind of, uh, you know, dealing with things, uh, you know, in, in a crisis uh, and, you know, any other advice you'd have in general about, uh, you know, managing and leveraging uh, the cloud? Yeah, I think uh, in, in a closing comment, I think one of the most important aspects that can be considered is is having that translation capability of talking to the business element, the, the government service component that understands what they're trying to achieve, what their purpose or their mission is, and then being able to tie it back to the technology in a way to where all parties, all stakeholders understand their roles and responsibilities um, to make that happen. Uh, unfortunately, I think uh, what happens too often is on the business side or the you know the non-technical side of the equation they see the end state but they don't truly understand their responsibilities to get to the end state um, and it's it's definitely a partnership and the better that partnership's understood at the start the more successful the project's going to have uh, to get there uh, under budget and on time all right well th thank you so much for joining us uh, you know best of uh, luck with the the, the, the project and uh, please stay safe thank you for having me all right, stay tuned for more coverage from AWS Public Sector Online. I'm Stu Miniman, and thank you for watching theCUBE.